This is the meeting of the uh, Rules and Bylaws uh, Committee, uh, Friday, March 4th, 2022, uh, 5.30 uh, p.m. Um, roll call, Ben Wadsworth, present. Fernanda Sanchez, absent. Selena Ortega, Absent, Vincent Chente Montalvo. Present. Benny Madeira. Present. Um, quorum having uh, been achieved, uh, we will now uh, uh, proceed to uh, our agenda. Uh, any unagendized public comment? I don't see any in public comment. Okay. Um, that being the case, let's take a look at our standing rules. If you take a look at the um, um, copy that I furnished you, um, the standing rule takes a majority vote of the uh, of the council. Uh, they are the guides for uh, what we do at our meetings. Uh, in the copy that I presented to you, um, highlighted in uh, yellow is uh, the changes that I'm suggesting. Uh, the first one, uh, the voting membership uh, uh, of the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council is now 25 because they eliminated one of our uh, youth representatives. Uh, the minimum number of members required to take official action is 13. So that would be the quorum. The minimum number of members required to pass bylaws would be 17. That is a uh, two thirds uh, majority. The minimum number of votes required to pass an item is seven votes, down, down from uh, eight votes uh, when we were larger by one member. Okay, any questions, any suggestions? Yeah, the, on, the, on, on the quorum, is there any way we can go lower on it? Normally, normally it's half, and I know we're, we're we're down more than half already at thirteen. And it's, it's right, only, and it's only because it's like you know, Ben. It's been hard to keep uh, members on the board. Oh, I I agree. I was told, and and I I don't know if it's correct because I've heard them dance around this. Okay. But the last time we rewrote our bylaws and so on. We were told that we could not lower the quorum below uh, one half of our membership um, rounded up to the next whole number. Mm -hmm. And I keep hearing, oh, yes, you can do that. But then the other side of it is, well, yeah, but you've got to reduce the number of memberships. So that means you've got to eliminate people on the board. Um, and I've, they've, they've never cleared that up. Is, Cause I don't, I don't know if it would be worth it, you know, because I know we're going to have to meet again before April on this. And, um, I don't know if it'll be worth it to actually write in and get confirmation on it <laughs> because there's, there's a couple of other things that I, not, not on the standing rule, but on the bylaws. To make it a lot easier for us to maintain form, but also our area representatives, because in our meeting the other night or yesterday, excuse me, we had areas that don't have representatives, but we got board members like myself, right? Like I'm the treasurer. Um, right. I kind of think we have more members, but we just don't have them in district three or one. It would be nice to be able to appoint 
a board member to represent that in the event that nobody runs in those seats, but we have representation at the board and the public has representation. So that's why sometimes when well, I see this, you know, if we lower it. Well, 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 technically we can fill um, the way the bylaws are set up um, and the, the basis of which the bylaws were originally written is that each area has at least one resident representative. Okay, the at-large representative can be in, or hopefully is in the same area, but uh, can be any uh, stakeholder. So uh, if someone uh, wanted to run for an at-large position, um, all they have to do is be a, a stakeholder in, in uh, the Lincoln Heights area. I think that uh, I think that it, it would have in the previous neighborhood council I think it was, we were always struggling to make forum but I haven't seen that issue uh, I hear too much noise in the background yeah I'm sorry I'm Put, yeah. put it under put it under your mask, Benny. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Does that help right there? Yeah. Okay. So I was saying that in the previous neighborhood council, I think quorum was an issue. We were struggling with it the whole time, but I don't see it being an issue for with this neighborhood council. And the fact that we're going down one, I think is even better. So I don't know, I'm just saying, um, yeah. it's not, it's, it sounds good to me. 13 is a good, is a good number um, for us. That, that's just my take. I just don't see us struggling to make more of this with this neighborhood council. Yeah, that's the only thing. I just want to make sure that we we have it because I know in the you know in the future, sometimes we're stable in the beginning, and then th you know things happen in people's lives, and right, it's always been an issue that way. You you're always by one sometimes that one person, and you never know when someone's going to leave. That's why in other neighborhood councils that I've been in, we have lowered our quorums. We never had an issue, but I've always said this: every council district is different. So that's why I would I would suggest that we send an email to our representative, which is Jose, and and get get an idea of what what is allowable, what is not. Because like Ben was saying, one day you hear one thing, the next day it's another, right? Yeah. So you'd have to come back and reevaluate the the council seats and then the quorum to be able to meet it. So if it's if it's fifty one if it's fifty plus one, then it's a simple majority, you know? And then right. it's above the, it's above the, the the quorum. If we can go below that by at least two, like if my, my suggestion would have been at least eleven to play it safe, because you could always have more, right? It's always trying to make the quorum. If eleven was right. a safe number for us, where Ben put twenty five board members and eleven, maybe that would work out. The only consequence with that is that people would have to be aware now that they could not be half of that quorum. You couldn't be all together, you know, it would be what six people would then break that form. So you couldn't be all together. Right. That, time. <clears throat> that would be the only thing we'd have to notify the board members about just to know, you know, not to have that many people out there. And then I know the other one too, I seen here, the one Ben read item number three uh, for the amendment of the bylaws and two thirds, which is like 17 votes that's also too sometimes where we might have to amend something. I don't, you know, they only let us amend our bylaws one. Is it once every two years or four years, Ben? No, you can amend them uh, as long as you are so many days prior to the election. Okay. So with that one, I don't, it would be very hard, even like what we're talking about two thirds, because that's 75% of the, of the board to be able to amend the bylaw. And I, I believe to, to simplify some of this stuff up, we should stick with the simple majority, 51, 50 plus one. 
51 percent right that's just my opinion on it because i've seen in boards before where we need to alter a bylaw or we need to amend it some way because it, you know we didn't take everything into account and we're running with our heads chopped off because we can't get everyone on a quorum right to get two-thirds and i think sometimes if we stay on those particular things if we stay in middle ground we're able to at least get a simple majority of the vote in but i'm just throwing that out there i want i wanted to send out another one just with the suggestions that i had i can't get them out of the darn computer so when i get them out i'll send them to everybody uh, ben you can pick up i guess we talked about those but pick up and keep going down on the on your hey. Well, I just want to say that, like, okay, looking at the number, minimum number of people to pass the thing, uh, the, the, the uh, ban is suggesting seven, right, that we go down one. So if we go down to 11 for forum, that only puts the score away from the minimum amount of people that we need to pass the thing. So that's why I, I was thinking 13 is a good number, but I mean, I don't know, maybe we can compromise on 12. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I mean, think about, th think about it like this, Benny. It's like if we have 11 people there, then, you know, six, six votes is a simple majority. And it passes, right? So as right, the number right. gets smaller, all it does is, is it it allows us to hold a meeting with a smaller number of people to be able to pass official action on certain items that don't require two thirds of the vote. Well, I'm just thinking like, if we ever get to 25 and we have six votes needed to pass the six. That's, that's well, no, as, as, the number, as the number gets higher, so like you have 11, right? And let's say, the whole board shows up, the whole 25 people show up. So you need 51% of the whole board, not not the six votes just to pass something simply. You need 51% of it. In order for the board to function at its minimum, minimal capacity, if 11 people showed up to a meeting, then six people would vote and they would have simple majority of, or simple majority, right? So no matter if the number goes higher, the only thing that happens in the, is the the fifty one percent grows bigger, so it, it allows them to vote equitably. It just allows us to hold a meeting in the event that somebody doesn't show up. So it doesn't really shake it too much up, you know. Well, the, the other thing is with the um, the super quorum is to keep uh, from having uh, the council taken over by a majority. Uh, that they can change the bylaws uh, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And bylaws should be fairly well stable. I mean, ours have only been amended uh, uh, a couple of times uh, in the organization and, and largely the first one was um, on attendance and the second one was required by uh, uh, bonk and so on that all of our bylaws uh, be organized the same way have the same um, index so that um, uh, their people could figure out what part of the bylaws uh, was applied somewhere and um, then they added one one to our bylaws where we didn't have a vote they just put it in and um they reduced uh, our one uh, youth member mm -hmm. so uh by in general our bylaws have been quite stable um yeah, I don't know why I'm feeling a bit conservative you know, as far as the numbers. Um, what, what if uh, well, I'm just going to throw these numbers out? Like, instead of, uh, okay, okay, going down to seven instead of eight, going down to 12 instead of the 
suggested 13 for Bill, and then instead of 17 to uh, to amend the bylaws, we vote down to 16. Uh, I'm just throwing those numbers out. Um, what do you guys think? That way we go a little further from what Ben. I, I personally prefer to keep the bylaw amendment uh, very high. It, it keeps people from uh, playing around with the bylaws. Yeah, no, I mean, um, no, I, under, I understand that one. I'm just, I'm just thinking. Uh, okay, well, you know, like, like I said, why don't? Because I know one thing that we can move on that most of us agree on is probably checking to see if we can reduce the 13 without right. You know, with no issue, and I think that's the email we should send out. And if we okay, I'll check on that one. Okay, if we compromise on the amendment of the bylaws, and Ben Ben is at seventeen. Uh, Benny says reduce it by one, right? I was by like fifteen or simple majority, but you know, I'll meet in the middle at at sixteen. Yeah, six, sixteen was my suggestion. Yeah, so I mean, as long as we're somewhere where we can have, if we needed to do it, you know. We've been in situations where it's kind of you don't want to touch on Ben's right because they they need to be stable. They're the the governing document, but far too often when Dunn steps in or Empower LA steps in and they start manipulating and then they add in Bonk's regulation and everything that's not on ours. That's why you know look at it because sometimes you're not fighting with board members. You're actually fighting against the city when they're trying to use the bylaws. Yeah, that's true. But. No, no, okay. Well, let's let's say Ben, are you comfortable saying sixteen as a compromise, or or are you stuck at seventeen? I could deal with sixteen. Okay, let's leave it at that because Ben brought that up. I'm okay with that. So, let's say sixteen. Okay, then we go to um, um, number eight. Um, that was when we were deciding whether we were going to have two meetings or one meeting. And so that jumble in there, uh, showed up and the board never decided to hold a vote one way or another on that. So my suggestion is, uh, what I have there in yellow. The executive committee shall determine whether the board of directors shall hold one or two regular meetings each month by a majority vote. Okay. Well, I'm trying to think how like, okay, so when they when they have to determine that at the executive meeting, it has to be an agendized item for the month. Each month has to have that, that uh, decision to make at the beginning on whether they're gonna have one or two, or is this something that they could Say, look, um, we're having it the, for example, like the first and second Wednesday of each month, and then we set that for the year. Oh, uh, it could be done that way. Okay, one or two. Um, in in general, um, uh, we have when we were doing two meetings a month. Uh, to cancel out a meeting uh, during the holidays. Yeah. And um, the bylaws uh, basically allows you to do that. <laughs> but um, if Sarah wanted to continue uh, with two meetings a month, um, we wouldn't have to do that every meeting. You just do that. Okay. Um, the executive committee uh, decided on, on two meetings a month and it stays there until the executive committee and decides differently. Okay. Okay. I, uh, I, I, I like the two meetings a month. Is there anyone that, uh, that is looking to have one meeting a month? What? Is there anyone that's looking to have one meeting a month? 
Because I, I like the two movies a lot. I thought everybody liked the two. Um, I've lived under both one meeting and two meetings. To me, I like two meetings, but some people don't like to give up the time. Um, yeah, maybe it's because I can't get enough of you guys that I'm pushing for the two instead of the one. Um, no, but seriously, I, I, I could, I mean, two is easy for me. Uh, but yeah, but I, that's just my opinion. Well, you know, and that's why it would be left up to the executive committee to determine that. So they'll take right. into consideration whether, yeah. like Ben was saying, if there's a holiday, like, for example, 4th of July, obviously in July, we could have two meetings. We can shift the meeting to to kind of uh, counteract the 4th of July, have them the two last weeks of the, of, the, of the month, or say, no, July, we're having one, right? So it, yeah. gives, it gives the executive committee the discretion to pick a day or both. Well, like December, where we could have, take the second meeting at the dark period and just have the first meeting of the month. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, the, the, the bylaws still specify that the regular meetings, the regular meetings themselves, are on the first and third uh, Thursday. So all we would do is decide whether we hold one or two, not on the day. Okay. Um, if we want to decide on a day, that's a special meeting. Yeah, so, okay, and so the executive reserves that right uh, to make right. the decision. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. Okay. And then we get down to... Um, uh, 16, um, election to fill a vacancy. Um, originally, as the bylaws were set up, um, the idea, and, and you heard some of this uh, muttering from uh, Richard, he never lived under the, the original bylaws, nor did he have any knowledge as to how they were written. Uh, but the original bylaws were set up with the idea that if you have a vacancy, um, the board fills the, the vacancy by appointment. In other words, we, we among ourselves decide who we are elected of the stakeholders to fill that slot. If there were two or more running for the same slot, uh, the way the bylaws originally were set up was the idea that both candidates would have an extra couple of weeks to get their, their supporters there and they would be voted on by a majority of the stakeholders present at a neighborhood council meeting. Um, unfortunately, then later on, Dunn comes down with the, you can't have a secret ballot. Uh -huh. And you are almost stuck with the idea of you got a room full of people how do we have a vote uh for all of the people in the room i mean you can't do it by a show of hands you'd go nuts so then there's the question is how do we identify the stake uh, stakeholders and the answer was, well, uh, the neighborhood council is not allowed to uh, query a person as to uh, uh, proving their stakeholders status in a meeting. So we have a jumble in there. And so um, I basically simplified it the way it's, it's pretty much set up now, election to fill a vacancy. Uh, must be placed on a regular agenda of the board of directors by the executive committee 
prior to the next regular board meeting, um, next regular board of directors meeting. And that's pretty much what we've been doing now. Someone says, uh, you know, here's my application to fill uh, a business representation and they give up, they, they say their piece, the public says their piece and the people that vote are the members of the neighborhood council and we can either vote the person in or vote them down. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that, that, oh, go ahead. Sorry, that, that, just, that just cleans it up. No, I agree. I think it, it holds it, uh, puts it in, and it puts it in the board members hands. Right. Some, 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 some neighborhood councils, what they do is they allow the the president to appoint, and the board ratifies. But I like this because it's very democratic. It gives the power back to the board by its majority, and this one would be a simple majority, right? You're right. Okay. Yeah, I don't. And, I, don't have, I don't have a problem with sixteen. And the, the, the point that was, was made was one of the reasons why the board uh, is there is the only one that knows for sure um, who is a stakeholder and who isn't are the members of the board because yeah. they were identified as specific stakeholders to begin with. You don't know who is your stakeholder out in the audience. Exactly. And I, and I think we've seen that we, we litigated on a case with it because once you include a stakeholder, not a board, not an elected board member, but a stakeholder, which would be probably more democratic even, a next step, but then it becomes an election. And that, right. that's where it becomes an issue. So, no, I like the way it's written now that it gives it, you know, to the, the executive committee would, would put it on the next regular agenda and then the, it would become an agenda item that the board of directors would then take on. And like Ben said, it's a normal item. They come up, say what they need to do, public comment, board member comment, vote. They're either in or out. So I think it's good like that. The other one that I added down below it is number 17. Um, There's only a few of our committees that are really active. Um, and unfortunately, um, a lot of the committees, um, no one, no one uh, even wanted to be a chairman of, let alone be on the committee. And uh, when Frank Water was alive, uh, he was technically chairman of almost every committee that uh, that uh, didn't have any any real membership, and it's not that he ever did anything or anything, but then all of a sudden uh, they decided, well, um, everyone should be on uh, a committee, and no one should be on more than three committees. Well, everyone is not on a committee, even even what we have now. And um, there's a, a few cases where we need a, a person to be on uh, or the ability to be on more than three committees. And technically, um, the standing rules, not the bylaws, uh, say, well, no, she can only, she or he can only be on three committees. So my suggestion is what I have there on 17. Um, no board member can serve as a member of more than three standing committees unless given permission by a majority vote of the board of directors. Okay, that's a that's a good um, amendment to it. It gives us it gives us leeway. It's kind of like now, Benny. We only have three people. If one of us didn't show up we didn't have quorum. So this whole meeting agenda would have to be postponed re right. and re-agendized. So at least with this one, 
if we know somebody has interest in it and they're really going to be dedicated to it, the board can they can put an agenda item like say, Benny want Benny's already part of a, a three neighbor three committee, but he wants to be part of the homeless. So you would have to go because that would be your fourth one. It would have to be agendized by the executive committee and then it would be put onto the agenda. They would vote. If the majority voted, you would have the special privilege under the standing rule to be able to be part of the, the next, com you'd be four committees. Right. And we don't have that right now, which I think this is good. It, it does the flexibility. And um, then 21, uh, 22, I guess it is. 20, I'm suggesting we strike that. Um, Procedure for correction of board members. Yeah, that we had a, uh, a district secretary that uh, started lecturing uh, one of the members for, uh, you know, a, a, a minor uh, excursion that never been discussed by the board, and she took it on herself to uh, raise holy hell with the member for, for doing something. And it's sort of like, you don't need to create antagonism. The, the executive board hadn't even been uh, made aware of the situation. So we put that in and it, it's clumsy and we never used it. I, I see no reason why it should stay in there. Um, so my suggestion is that whole section 20 be struck. Uh, that would change 21 to 20. And letter, 20, letter B, letter B would be struck too, 20B? Yeah, oh, all yeah, of that oh, would yeah, be oh, struck. Yeah, it is struck, okay. And 21 would, would be, 22 would be the new 21. And my suggestion is um, attendance at regular committee meetings, a member of one of the neighborhood council committees may be removed from the committee by either the committee chairperson or the neighborhood council president for failure to attend two or more consecutive committee meetings without being excused by the chairperson in advance. Committee member may notify by mail, text, or phone. Uh, and I, I, I added message to the chairperson of their inability to attend a committee meeting. I'm sick. I can't be there type of thing. Mm. See, I often, when I looked at this one a long time ago, I don't know which case I was working on. <laughs> I was looking at it and I was like, okay, when they call in, there's no way to verify. It's kind of like the stakeholder type of thing. There's nowhere for us to verify as, as chairperson. Like I asked myself, um, Benny calls in land use and he says, I'm sick. And I, sometimes I think that, that like these type of rules, it's based upon an individual, right? I, I see the other advantage that if somebody is just doing it and, they're, and you know they're disregarding uh, the committee and they joined it and really didn't want to do with it, then this triggers a way to get somebody off, you know? I kind of like leaving it up to the people to say, look, if you're, if you're going to join, you're an adult, you shouldn't need a rule like 22 that says, hey, Benny, if you're not showing up um, in two days, I'm the chair, I can remove you, you know? It's like, we want to show, hey, you're responsible, you got in there, do the work. If you don't know, reach out so people can help, right? We can get training in there. Um, I want to think about this one a little bit more, but I see where you're going with it, Ben. Yeah, the, the, the question, um, on the removal by a committee chairperson, um, I'm, I'm just wondering if the committee chairperson if we need to word that so that they can 
they can recommend to the to the president to remove someone uh, and then leave it up to the president to make a decision as to removal or not. And one of the reasons I, I'm thinking of that is um, we'll use Benny as an example. Um, Richard removed him from uh, the pluck committee. Uh -huh. And um, it was, well, he didn't show up the meeting on time and he didn't like the way he voted on some things. And um, the, the actual bylaws uh, does not give the committee chairperson the power to remove someone. Yeah, the final. Right. So I think that needs to be um, the committee chairperson may recommend uh, to the president that a, a member should be removed. Um, and the president shall have the final. Right. No, I, I can see that. I, you know, the only thing, like, I like that idea because it goes through through two, two points of the chain of command, right? The actual chain right. that's in there. Um, and then it lets another person cast. But when I look at that, too, I'm, I'm always thinking, like, for example, Benny doesn't show up. Benny just tells me he's sick. He doesn't show up again and again and again, and he's sick and he's sick and he's sick. There's nothing, there's no remedy for it, right? Because it says right here, failure to attend two meetings. At that point, not having any proof or anything, it triggers me to call Sarah and say, hey, Sarah, I'm putting Benny on the chopping block. There's still no evidence of it, right? Just Benny's testimony. Right. And based on that, Sarah can say, okay, Benny, that's it. We've, we had enough. You're gone. And the only thing I, the only thing I see with that sometimes is that the person that's being removed has no remedy or a pill process, right? Or uh, be able to say, look, they were real medical. Here's, and that's the one thing I was looking at this on why it's like, I have to give a doctor's note, right? An actual doctor's note. And that can violate HEPA. We got to be careful. Right. With that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can see, I think we need to look into that one a little bit more, but I like the idea of going to the president to finalize it. I just think we have to look at that. How do we prove it? Right. It's like a court. Right. Case. How do you prove it? How do you prove Benny's doing it on purpose? If we're taking his word for it, then that as a chair, I'm not going to be comfortable to say, yeah, he has to be removed because he missed two meetings, but he told me he was sick both times. And even if I get it up to Sarah, then the question is, she doesn't even know what's going on in the committee. Uh, I could just write a small report, but there's still no evidence, right? There's just right. But the other the other side, I'm thinking in a in a small committee. Um, if you've got a committee of three, we'll say, and one person consistently isn't there, then you never have quorum. And so um, uh, the committee and the chairperson are ineffective in doing anything. That's true. So how do you uh, how do you correct that problem? That's true. Um, so if we if we worded it, the chairman can recommend it. Um, and. Yeah, the person has uh, um, you know, the, the, the problem there. They could be sick, they could be a lot of things, um, but we still need to remove them from the committee. Um, so that the committee can function mm -hmm. if, we, if we're in that situation. Um, if the committee is still functioning and the person is there, um, what you don't want is so the chairman can decide, well, I don't like that person because I don't like the way he votes. He doesn't go along with me. 
Um, and so I, I want to drop him from the committee. Yeah. That was sort of uh, Richard's case with Benny. I can see that because there's, I'm trying to look at the, you know how you weigh the value on them. And I can see that that's a good point because it wouldn't be just the chair and his personal bias towards Benny, but he'd have to get the, the final approval of the president and the president may be neutral, but maybe not, you know, but right. it's like, we, we can't, there's never a hundred percent, but I could see that the potential Benny has a, a backup that he can go to the president to and plead his case out. Right. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Any, any other suggestions? No, not on this one. Okay. Shall we go to, uh, uh, to the, uh, bylaws? Yeah. Um, so on 22, we're going to think about, think about it some more. Okay. We'll have another meeting, Benny. And if you want, go review and do it like um, Ben did. You can PDF file it, and then you can strike things and highlight them like he did. I can show you one day. If, if you don't know how to do it, I'll show you how to do it. Okay. So let me see. This one is not. Oh, yeah, here they are. Okay. So we started at uh, the youth rep, Ben, E. Uh, what, are, what are we at now? Let me see. We're on the bylaws, but I didn't see any other thing that was highlighted up. So let me see. OK. Um, the first is on quorum. Okay. That's Article 5. Uh, section two, uh, uh, Article Five, Governing Board, um, Youth Representative. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Um, the original idea uh, was that. Um, the only one that could vote for a youth representative were, were uh, uh, the youth of the committee. And that kind of, it does, uh, when Dunn runs the elections, they don't follow through with that. And it's, it's very, very hard. You'd have a youth representative, uh, in some cases, elected by one or two people. So, I just suggested that uh, a board member elected from this category, this board member will be elected by a majority vote and must be in high school with a minimum age of 14, but not older than 17 years and 11 months from the day of the election. Um, the quorum, section two, Uh, that's one that I will need to ask. Can we go below? Uh, can we go below 13? All right. Okay. Uh, on section six vacancy. Um, the original, when they made the changes and screwed around where the tied vote shall be resolved via the city clerk tied vote uh, process. Uh, bottom line is, what in the hell is the city clerk's tied vote process? <laughs> um, so I said, via the flip of a coin by the presiding officer of the meeting. Any any thoughts on that? Uh, it's kind of hard because you know you know Ben how they do it, and when they say city clerk's tied vote process, 
you know, where they have that thing hidden, because it, it automatically kills our bylaws, right? So let's say we write something here. They're going to over overstep our bylaws and insert theirs. Well, this is this is us filling vacancies. This, this isn't the, the election. The election procedure they use, whatever it is. But this is where we have a vacancy and we vote to fill it. Um, if you have two people running and they happen to have, um, let's say we have a quorum of 14 and we've got seven and seven. Uh, it's a tied vote, now what? Um, see, with Robert's rules of order, right? Like we have, we're following Robert's rules of order. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, how, how hard, I mean, we flip a coin, you're either in or out, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't see a problem with it. I mean, I like. I mean, in Robert's in Robert's rules of order, usually the president doesn't participate for this reason, you know, and only particip only votes if there's a a tie, and they're usually tiebreakers. Um, okay, so I, I read that. So um, you know, the flip of the coin at first. Uh, oh, uh, I was like, did I read that correctly? <laughs> Not a flip of coin. You know, that was a problem actually in a football game yeah. where. Where they flipped it, they caught it, they turned it, and then there was an argument as to what what was it, heads or tails. So now now they're flipping it and they're letting it hit the ground so that it won't be touched and everybody could see it was heads or tails. So if we're gonna do the coin flip, just wonder at that we should let the coin hit the, hit the ground, I guess. So that I could just no I, I could just see it happening like I flip it. And Benny's on the bottom because we're on Zoom and no one can see at the bottom. And then I get the camera and tilt it down. You already have flipped it over. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know the con. It was a big controversy that coin deal, right? Where they let it go. But yeah, I mean, if this is the only way we have, because if we, you can't turn around and give it back to the board because they voted to tie it already. Yeah, you know. If if we say if we go back and do a second vote and somebody <laughs> somebody changes their vote but they don't want to then it's a waste of time right we're just beating the the horse again and uh, maybe that's the only way we can put it you know the flip of a coin and we'll flip of a coin that'll hit the ground <laughs> yeah. I think that's fine. I mean, it's... you know, and, and this is what's good about it because we're looking at what what, what uh, Ben had put out, and I think they're good ones, right? Um, and that's why we have to meet again because the ones that I have, I wanted to put them up, and I'll just brief go through a couple of them because the one that Ben's fixing, they're pretty good. They were some of the ones that I was looking at, but there was just one that I seen that we can simplify. But I want to see what Ben is Ben's uh, doing here because I can understand what he's doing. I would say let's leave this one for right now, but um, let's look into it. You know, if there's another alternative way, but I think Ben probably, hit, you know, probably got this one right because I'm trying to think of another way that we could possibly, you know, ha break a tie. But then if your board already voted a tie, it, what other way by majority, you know? Yep. So, yeah, I would leave it and then just for homework, Benny, you know, because Ben already knows what's going on here, but if you can look around by our next meeting just to find something different and bring it up, if not, this one will hold. Because I'm just thinking about another way to do it, but I, I can't see it. So, okay. so I, I move to keep this one like this for right now until our next meeting when we finalize them. Okay. And any other, my, my next one is the selection of officers. Where was that one at? Let me see. 
uh, Article 6, Section 3. There we go. If a vacancy occurs after a conclusion of the city administered election, the officer shall be elected by a majority vote of the members of the neighborhood council. Okay. Yeah, I think this one's simple and straight to the point because, at, you know, sometimes, you, you, you know, Ben, I mean, you've been around on this one, you know, because these, sometimes it's just a simple vote. You lose a treasurer and you got to fill it right away. Yeah. So I agree with this one. Okay, and then uh, uh, quorum for committee shall be majority of the uh, uh, rostered members. I said one half of the rostered members of the committee rounded up the next whole number. That's good. And then under meeting time and place, regular meetings of the board shall be held on the first and third Thursday of every month. Uh, a calendar of regular meetings shall be established by the board. Um, I, I struck at uh, its first regular meeting of each calendar year because we've never successfully done that. What, and, and I'm kind of thinking too, um, Ben, on this one that that section one kind of contradicts uh, line D because the the executive committee is already determining whether to hold one or two meetings, and then the board up here is determining the days. Well, even like this for the first and third Thursday, we probably have to strike that out too, just because down here, it would limit them on D to only Thursday, the first and third Thursday that they could have the meeting. Uh, only for regular meetings. For regular, correct. That's why when um, I read it up here, regular meetings of the board shall be held on the first and uh first and third Thursdays of every month. So if the executive committee, for example, um, if we wanted to hold a meeting, let's say Christmas was on the, uh, Christmas Eve is on the first Thursday and, and Christmas Day is on the third Thursday, right? Technically, we wouldn't be able to hold it because we would only be allowed to do it on the first and third Thursday. No, we could do a special meeting. But that, that's only if you had an agenda, like if we had an old agenda that we had to do. Well, under the Brown Act, it says the only way we can hold a special is if it's to um, to finish up work that we didn't do on a, on a regular agenda. So like the way it's written here with the first and third Thursday, it would limit us because this would probably be new business. There might be some old business left over, but I think it, it requires you to have... Um, you know, leftover business. That's what the special meetings are. Yeah. The, a couple of things or thoughts that came into that. Um, a regular meeting, um, the member could plan on it. He knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knows that if he misses it um, without permission, that uh, he could be removed ultimately. Um, if the executive committee decided they could dance the meeting around from uh, starting at, uh, uh, let's not do Thursday, let's do Tuesday this week and next week is, is Monday. And let's say the uh, kid has some college classes. He's automatically stuck because you've changed it after he's got his college classes or uh, whatever else. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, to me, what is meant by the regular. We know that it's going to be there. 
Um, Or un unless we add in, like, we, like that would be our goal, but kind of like what you added in the last one where it said the executive committee will have, shall have the, the authority to change the date if needed. Because then at, at that point, like, I'm kind of thinking, you know, when you have a board, let's say the last board came in and Thursdays was perfect for them, right? But then you yeah. get another board that comes in and Wednesdays are better for them. So you can't keep having special meetings to, to adhere to the Wednesday. And then that's when you would have to come to the bylaw to change it. Because they would have to say the first and sec the first and third Wednesday of every month. That way, if we give the, the executive board um, the authorization to pick the date, because I know what I know what you're saying, because the one thing that's important is to keep a pattern with the people. That way they know right. every, every third and first Wednesday or Thursday is our meeting. But, you know, Ben, it's been, it's so hard sometimes with people's schedules and even the committees are like that, right? Like ours meets on Wednesday because no one can do it on a Thursday. So if we, if we didn't have that leeway to do that, then technically by our bylaws, we would be violating them. Um. I think this one needs a little bit more flexibility. In we could we could say in there, uh, the executive committee, uh, put it E, the executive committee may recommend um, other dates. Uh, Well, maybe kind of like C-Ben, the president, well, maybe not the president, but the majority of the executive committee shall be allowed to call an unregular uh, general meeting as needed. Yeah. I'll have to think of, of, of how to word that, but yes. Okay. By, by majority vote. Um, uh, the executive committee may recommend or may um, may choose to hold uh, a regular meeting on a different day of the week. Yeah. That, that way it sets it sets what we want is try to meet the first and third Thursday, but in the event that we can't, the executive committee has the authorization to change the dates on it. Right. I mean, it, it's just hard, I know, because I, I agree that it has to be on, a, on the same day all the time, and it's just, it gets into a headache when it's not. You got to get into a rhythm. Yeah, and I didn't know that a uh, special meeting could only be about unfinished business. Yeah, it was ruled in a couple of cases where some, you know, because before you, people would use special meetings, like we were talking about, like, for example, on this one, we could have said, oh, this is a special meeting. But the courts found that special meetings, why, why was it special for you to have it when you couldn't have it on a regular? It had to be special because the content of the, the original regular meeting did not get finished and you had a special meeting. And then there was the emergency meeting, which is something that you know, has to be done immediately. <clears throat> That's yeah. why they have such short uh, 20, they have the 24 hour notices when you do them. Regular board meetings shall be held at least once per quarter. And may be, may be held more frequently as determined by the board. Mm -hmm. And see, even in this one, like we have to go through these bylaws again because this one, in one of the, in one of them, it gives the executive committee shall determine, you know, whether one or two meetings will be held, and they kind of contradict each other in here when it you have to go to the board now. In that middle one you were reading, regular board meetings shall be held at least once per quarter and may be held more frequently as determined by the board. That's not the executive committee. 
So that one would have to be altered too. That's what I'm saying with these. Like when we look at what we're talking about right now, we should go back and review these documents again and look right. at these little ones so that we can straighten them out. And then, because at the end of the day, what it is, is we're giving the executive committee the power to be able to set the dates, try to adhere to the first and third Thursday, step one. Step two, if you can't do that, then you, you uh, from a majority of the of the executive committee, they would be able to say, well, after determining we can't meet the first step, we're going to now go to, you know, option two, which is we're going to maybe send out a, and I wouldn't want to write it in so that it's not an official step, but what we should do is get a tally of who can meet on what day. And usually what you try to do is get all the people that can meet on the same day, even if you can't get everyone on and set the date on that. Because the goal is to try to get the quorum so that the board can conduct business. In a perfect world, we try to get everybody, but we can all the time. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think the regular board meetings shall be held at least once per quarter and may be held more frequently as determined by the executive committee. Mm -hmm. Prior to any action by the board, there shall be a period of public comment. The, the board shall determine the length and format as period is appropriate. Um, I think that part could be struck, don't you? Correct, Ben. Yeah, because the, the fact that they can comment is already taken over by the Brown Act and length and format, well, that's already going to be discussed. So that's the, the purpose of the, of the executive committee. Okay. Okay. Let's see if there's anything, any others that I Uh, <clears throat> under training, um, I said members of the Planning and Land Use Committee must also take Planning 101 and any other uh, required training. Okay. That's what I was looking at. Let me see. Oh, oh here it is. Okay. Members of the planning and land use must take also planning one one and any other required cities training. Okay, and that's that was the last one, right, Ben? Yeah. Did you have did you have any uh Benny? Yeah. I did have some stuff. Actually uh, uh, you want me to go through them or? Yeah, yeah, if you have them, now's the time. Oh, okay, uh, I can share, I can share my screen or? Yeah, let me give you the screen share. Give me one second. I'm gonna make you a co-host. Okay. Okay, let me stop sharing mine. Okay, so I guess. Huh. See if I could do this. <laughs> You guys see that? Yeah, I got it, Ben. I can see it on my end. Okay. I can't see it that much on mine because I'm doing it off my cell phone. Oh, okay. So I just went through and um, yeah, let's see here. I highlighted a few things, not not too many. Uh, so yeah, so the stakeholder definition comes from the city. That's not us. That's not for us to mess with, right? Yeah, that's that's already pre-done. Okay, that, that's good. Right. Um, uh, section two. Um, I guess I just needed clarity on it. It's uh, Article Five, Governing Board, Section. Section two on forum. I highlighted the first part that says may not be counted as part of the forum for that issue. 
then at the end it says, and shall be counted as part of form. So I was a little confused. What one are you looking at, Benny? Uh, section two, forum. Uh, article section yeah. two, quorum. Yeah, on the first part on the top of the paragraph, it says the form shall be 14. If any member recuses himself or herself on a particular issue, they may not be counted as part of the quorum for that issue. Okay, so that makes sense. Somebody recuses themselves, is there, they're not counted as part of the quorum, right? At the end, I'm reading, and shall be counted as part of the quorum. Are we we're talking about something else here? You see so that, that at, the, at the end of the paragraph? Yeah, that's counting if any member recuses himself or herself as a particular issue that may not be counted as part of the form for the last issue. If less than 18 years of age, you representative shall be precluded from voting on financial matters such as neighborhood council expenditures, financial reports, annual budgets, contracts, and recommendations to enter into contracts. We may participate in the board discussion of these items and shall be counted as part of the quorum. It's basically what it does is it, it doesn't allow someone under the age of 18 as a youth representative to vote on financial matters, contracts, budget, recommendation, financial reports, but anything right. else they can vote on. Okay. As long as it's not mentioned in those. And you know, the only, the only one thing about the youth representative, uh, Ben, I, I looked in, I, I looked at it and I want to, I want to make them as inclusive as we can into that. And I think, you know, sometimes when we strip away their votes, even in financial matters, I don't know if the city restricts them. Because I was trying to remember in the funding training, if you had to be 18 years of age. To be yes, to... you do. You do. Yes, you do. Okay. That's what I was, I was Because, because um, you're not of legal age uh, in a contract or something like that was the argument I remember. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, we have a great youth representative right now, and I, I agree with Chante that we should try to not restrict her as much as possible. You know? Yeah, like what what we can do because we're gonna come back. We can I'll review some of this stuff with the the financer. I'm gonna talk to the city clerk, and I'll be talking to Jose. I'm just gonna go over some of this stuff, but I think Ben's right in the way it's written here. Like most of this stuff is financial stuff. Like, even if she can vote on the MERs, um, which is not a contract, it's just a, an acknowledgement of um, the funding that we passed. But stuff like um, like MPGs and all that, they wouldn't uh, let her vote on them. Right. You know? and, and I'll check. Who knows? The way the city works, one day they say no, the next day they're like, sure, go ahead. You know? <laughs> but at least, um, even if she doesn't have the vote, this says they have the um, uh, the right to uh, discuss it. Yeah, they, they can't go, but they can they can state their opinion. Okay. The other thing I had highlighted here was uh, I don't have any strong feelings about this, but extensions counting as a yes. Uh, do we want to keep, keep stay with that? Which uh, which number is that? It's a uh, section three, official actions, which is article article five, section three. Section three of what article? Uh, article five, which is uh, abstention, which will act as a yes vote. Do we want to stay stay with that? Because I notice that's not the case in other bodies. So um, I'm open up a big kind of works, so uh, I'm just saying that I, thought, I just thought it was interesting that uh, do we want to keep do we want to keep it that way? What the, usually usually a lot of the boards have it, and it doesn't matter whichever way you use it, right? Like if you were to say a no vote is a no vote for the the abstentions. Um, if we keep it this way, the, the common practice is to make sure that when people vote, we should announce that an abstention vote 
is a yes vote. And that sometimes suffice because no matter if you put yes or no, they're people people forget. Yeah, they're not gonna know. So if we remind them and just say a yes vote, an abstention vote is a yes vote. And that way we at least bring up section three of official action. And if they vote to abstain, right, because they don't want to get involved or don't want, you know, they don't want to be politically hung out there, right? Yeah. Um, but their vote will be a yes. And even if we turned it to a no, their vote would be a no, and you're still taking a position, basically. Okay. Yeah. Most people think that the abstention is to stay neutral because you don't want to upset anybody, but it's a position on here. Okay. Yes. So on that same article five, section five, duties and powers, I put down here on the margin, not even the president. It just seems weird that the president does not have the right to represent us. That's the way I read it for section five. I would think if anybody had the right to represent us, it would be the president. There is, there, we, in the Elysian Valley, we, we appointed the president or automatically when the president came in because they, like in any board, the president is the, the executive chief, right? Um, and we gave them emissary power, which basically allowed them to represent them, represent us in good faith on the issues that have come before the board. So nobody can, can go and say, hey, I represent this, this, is this, right? If it didn't pass the council, we can't talk about it. But in good faith, the president could go and actually attend a meeting without permission of the board and say, we came up on this issue, right? We're pro-river, you know what I mean? Or yeah, we're the, board may de the board may designate by uh, official action any uh, individual's authority to represent uh, the, uh, before a public, public body, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I think like what Ben brings up is good because sometimes, you know, if you think about this process, when things happen, and this happened to me a lot, this is why we changed it in Elysian Valley. When we were there, our president, we couldn't speak on anything because of something like this, right? Because we had to go to the board, write a motion, get authorization. Right. But by the time that happened, the opportunity passed, right? So I think on this one, we should write that our president should have emissary uh, powers over speaking on behalf of the board, right? But um, emissary powers, as long as they stay within the board's what they approve, right? Stances that we've taken, specifically that on development, specifically on issues like, you know, if we take anything on the cops or parks or they can then go out freely and say, no, we wrote a letter against the Dodger Park. You know? And, and that's why it's within those guidelines of things that are only have been approved by the council. So you can't go off on a rant, you know, and you don't need to have as only the president, but I think anybody else, some of this has to be written in, but anybody else other than the president would have to have that special authorization. Yeah. And this, and this part doesn't say anything. It doesn't even say the word president in there. No, because what it does is it, it, like, say, like, if, if Sarah wanted to do it, Sarah would then have to write a motion. The motion would be put onto the board, and the board can deny her or give it to her. And like I said, most of the time, like, when I was in Elysian Valley and we were at, like, Congress and Neighborhood Councils and there was a good opportunity to bring up an issue, technically, as a board member, I couldn't say nothing because I didn't have the authorization to speak on behalf of the council. So if we gave that to the to the president, right, because they're they're in the president's seats for obvious reasons, um, then we give them the power to be able to speak exactly at that time only on issues that have, that have been approved, not that have come before the board, but issues that have been approved by the board. So they would be restricted to things that we have already taken action on, not just simple talk like yeah, we all don't like. The but if something or... goes down, for example, if something goes down and it the media comes out, Sarah's there, we haven't discussed the issue on the board because, you know, it was an unexpected. Wouldn't yeah. she be able to speak on our behalf? Or... 
Well, it, it's left up to the to her discretion, right? The pre, whoever the president would be, if it's Sarah or anybody else, it, it that's why the the power and authority that's given by the board and what we're doing right now in the bylaws, <coughs> it's, it's in good faith that the person <coughs> will act and execute the duties of the presidency, and an, as the emissary of the of the group, that they would talk within the boundaries of what had been approved versus what your personal opinions are, right? So, like I said, like the Dodger Diamond, we passed the letter already. If you stay within those guidelines, she can talk to anybody, recreation and parks, anybody, as long as they were within. If she, now, when they step out of those guidelines, that has to be called into question, and there's already <laughs> processes for that. There's an easy motion to clear. It. But anybody else on the board other than the president has to ask for special permission for it. Right. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll look at that one. That one's a good one, Benny. Uh, so keep on scrolling here. Uh, <laughs> I see you have the second consecutive misrepresented board meeting. Yeah, I, I think I was just highlighting it. For myself, so I'm just going feelings about this. I think I think on this one that I'm looking at, you're thinking under section seven, absences. A board member who is absent three consecutive regular meetings is automatically removed from the board at the adjournment of the third meeting. Uh, with passage of this amendment, absences will be counted beginning with the regular meeting. Like this one is almost, it's almost taking away due process because it says automatically. And not, and not like a bylaw that's on a council like this, that's governed by transparency and like the Brown Act, there should be a better process on it where it would say, you know, like anything, the board member would be put up for review by the board, then the board would be <coughs> by a majority of the council, right, of, of his or her removal based on the, it comes back to how do we even improve, right, like if the person's sick, how do, you know, because that's what's going to come up at the meeting on a motion, the motion to remove Benny for missing three consecutive meetings, right, there's nothing no proof that I can be other than Benny's good faith that he's not lying to us and that he was sick those three times and then the board will then say, well, we believe you by a majority, a simple majority or not. So that, that's something to think about to put a process in here when there's a board. We have board removal because the uh, bonk uh, set something up and we probably have to go by this. We have to add some of that. Or read the removal and see if it doesn't already exist in there. Because theirs is more detailed and, and the people can even appeal it. You can appeal it to Empower LA and you can appeal it to Bonk. Which that I didn't like. The board should have it on the place, but they took that from us. Let's see here. Put down the definition of an excuse as opposed to an unexcused absence. <laughs> determined by the executive committee. Where is it? Where is it um, defined to what an unexcused absence is? Well, that, that's to, left up to the four executive committee members. So there's really no definition because they. Basically, if you come and say I got hung over and the, and the committee says, we believe you, Benny, that's a medical excuse or you got sick technically because you threw up, right? <laughs> the board, the executive committee has the determination to define it. Yeah. Oh, hold on. I think Ben, Ben's, uh... Ben, can you hear us? I just seen that your mic is off. I didn't know if you turned it off or it went off. So that one, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes you got to center it to make the determination and, and the executive committee. So your president, vice president, treasurer are the ones that make the decision on you guys would say you would submit a, a document that says I got sick from COVID three days in a row a week. Then we would get the letter and then we would the executive committee would determine, OK, Benny's sick. So you would have a valid a valid reason. The whole section eight cents censure censure. I have I have to read it over. I mean it's like it's a lot. Yes. Yeah. Censure and removal were added in by Bonk. They wrote these for us. Okay. Okay, so that's censure and removal. Written in by Bonk. Okay. Correct. Uh, this is a logistical thing here, six and seven. There needs to be a space. Okay. See that? Yeah. So what was that? Um, yeah, underneath removal, section nine. Missed the space there. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that was pretty much it. Yeah. I think the other thing I, I probably just want to bring up is, uh, like, I was a little confused between the, the, we have a grievance committee. I think I just need to understand that better, how it works. How the grievance process works. That's our that's, that's our customer service when you have a problem with the board member. <laughs> okay. And then um, this other thing right here, this doesn't make sense. The, the friendly amendment thing. This uh, make of a motion. The motion second may make changes to or accept proposed changes to their motion if they are both in agreement. Like, isn't it if you want to amend a motion, don't you have to? Which one are you looking at, Ben? Okay, so I'm on Article 12, letter A. Where it says the Maker of the motion and the motion second, they have to accept any changes to their motion. But I thought if you wanted to change a motion, you could make another motion. Well, that's that's a political move. You're getting too smart for us now. <laughs> so, but you're right. I mean, you have the the initial step. It's to say, like, I make a motion to accept Ben as the president, right? And you're going to say, yeah, but I want only for one year. That I want to amend the motion for a year. If I don't accept the motion, then it's not friendly. So your motion doesn't carry. And the original one stays. But the body would have to vote on whether the amendment on the amendment. Doesn't the body vote on the amendment? Not necessarily if this is here. This prevents that. Because it says right here, without a vote of the board, which okay. is the, the majority. So basically, if it's not, if, if the person who wrote the motion doesn't accept your friendly amendment, then it dies. Okay. And so the original, well, the original motion moves forward. Yeah, if the original motion moves forward, but then um, uh, you can vote to amend the motion. Mm. Well, if we the idea, that... the, the idea of the friendly emotion is that to avoid having too many votes uh, on something, that uh, if you put it in your in your motion, and okay, I as a friendly amendment to this, would you agree to uh, changing that to a year and a half? Um, if I agree to it then we don't have to go through the formal amendment process. If I say, no, I don't agree to that, 
then uh, the response would be, uh, I I move that this motion be amended to, to uh, say, and then we would have to vote on the amendment. If that vote passed, then the original motion is amended. Yeah, but you have to hold it. You have an extra vote in there. The yeah. idea of the friendly amendment is that avoids um, having to extra vote on something that people generally are in agreement on. Okay. Or well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because the only thing on here, Ben, like on A, this is Article 12, Parliamentary Authority, Section A of it. See, it, it does say right here, without a vote of the board. So that, that totally throws out, like what Benny was saying right now, the, the way the motion reads right now is I make the motion, Benny wants to amend it. I say, no, I don't accept your friendly emotion. It dies there under the way it's written because it says without a vote of the board. And usually like if Benny would say, okay, well, I want the board to vote on it. That strips him right here, just the, without a vote of the board. That strips that that part, and the original motion, as stated, carries. Now they now they can knock down the motion. Let's say they don't vote for it, right? Then you can reintroduce a motion that would say, "I want you know Ben there for a year." Do we have a second? Once someone seconds, it becomes live on the board. That that would be the process on that one. But this letter A under parliamentary procedure just strike. It does take away the power for the board to make a decision without a vote of the board. So I would literally have to agree to your amendment or it goes back to the original. And it doesn't let the board- Well, it goes back to the original, but I still have the right then to say, I move to amend the motion. But it just triggers it again right here on the second. Because if you look at item A, it says right here, without a board vote without a, a vote of the board. So in order for that amendment to stay alive, the board would have to take action. Right, because because the friendly amendment wasn't accepted. Correct. So now it becomes the formal motion to amend. The motion, let me see, the maker of the motion and the motion second may take changes or accept the process changes to the motion. If they are both in agreement without a vote of the board, the practice shall be known as. We'd have to rewrite this to make it because the way the way it's written here, it literally says the maker of the motion, which would be me, and the motion second, Benny, he wants to make the changes. If I don't accept them, if we're not both in agreement, then without any vote of the board which is what Benny would be using to say, hey, my, I want to push my motion across. I want to call for the vote to see if the board will, will accept my motion. I am right, right. the original one. Then it wouldn't happen because this right here says without a, without a vote of the board. And, and then it just, you know, the, and, and that's usually how it works with the friendly amendment. If I don't, if I say I don't want a friendly amendment, then you could call if the, if, if, if the bylaw doesn't allow it, stop you. You could call and say, well, hold on. I want the board to decide, not Vincent, right? So you kind of strip it. And then it, in the this one, if we wanted that to happen, we'd have to strike out without a vote of the board. That's what's holding it up. Because then that would, if that's not in there, then you would be able to say, okay, I want to call for the, the board to vote. And then that would trigger a vote. Mine would stall. Yours would be push up to the front. If yours prevails, then it mine's trumped, right? Yeah. Okay, we can strike that. That's that's easy enough to do. Yeah. I don't want to make it too hard for you, Ben. <laughs> I know you, you work good. I've seen a lot of these bylaws. I, I just think that, yeah, like, I mean, if there's an amendment, I think the body should vote on it. Well, some, vote sometimes when, you, when you're working on bylaws, you write yourself into a corner and you can't turn the corner. Yeah, that's true. That's why you need more than one head in there. Yes. Um, I think that's good for me. I think we should move on. 
Yeah, and we'll have another time, Benny, in our next meeting when we finalize these and when we get back reports from the city on the quorum and all that other good stuff. The only one I wanted to bring up to you guys, I'm going to take your sharing ability away, Benny. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so this is just food for thought for Ben, you, and uh, Benny. Okay, I was looking at a couple of things because, again, what we're dealing with is our area rep seats. And we're missing a lot, right? And they're they're going to be an important part to the future of how we work on the council. In some ways, when I look up at the, give me one second, I want to get everybody sick. It's this section here, okay? What section is that? This is a uh, section boundaries, Article Three boundaries, uh, Section Two. So this this one idea would would really shake up our bylaws right and what i propose is to remove the sub the sub areas and turn our voting district into one giant district right why when we break them up into districts like this like sub one sub two sub three if we don't have people running in those districts but we have the whole community running as as our whole district all thirty nine thousand people we have a better chance of grabbing more people on the board that might be interested. Whereas we fill up all the seats except for three and nobody wants three and we can't get anybody to run from district three, but there are other people in the neighborhood that would love to run, but can't just because they're limited to that. Now this subsection doesn't go away. If we do away with it in the vote, it actually helps our voting to get a little easier, but in the standing rules, we can appoint the sub area reps. So the area reps don't go away. It also gives us the flexibility to do what we have to do now. There's no repres there's no reps in district three. So if I wanted to, I'm in seven. If I wanted to, I could depending on how we wrote the bylaw, I would say I want to be in rep area rep three. And now area rep three would have representation. But that would mean that we would get rid of this system the way we have it now for voting. The 25 members would just be voted in by the by the the whole the whole district, the whole council district. There wouldn't be no more subsections on the voting. It would just be Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. They would vote for 25 people. We'd have on the standing rule appointment to the sub the sub areas. So if you're in sub area seven and you want to still serve in that area, priority goes to them. But if you have areas that are vacant, like three in any other area, or there's one maybe missing in seven, then we can use the appointment process. You know, um, we could either use an appointment or approval by a, a simple majority of the board. <laughs> the president could appoint and then the board ratify a simple majority. Because I think that would give us more leeway to fill these seats up. The idea is to fill them up, right? Like right now we can't fill them up because no one's in, in district three. <coughs> they, they literally would have to run in that area, live in that area to do that. <coughs> so I think it's a, it just gives us another tool to use to simplify the election, but also we can fill the area sub seats and still meet the needs of the community. You know what I mean? Um my suggestion would be a little bit different. And that would be um, under area representatives, <coughs> which would be Article 5B. Uh, <coughs> and that is if there is no representative for the uh, for a resident area representative for two or more consecutive uh, meetings of the board of directors, the resident uh, representative may be treated uh, as, in other, in other words, we could then fill it with any um, uh, stakeholder for the remainder of the term. Mm -hmm. 
that would allow the same thing without, as I'm thinking if, if we change, if we're not careful on how we change that, um, we come up for election and the whole board is up for shotgun courtesy of uh, the city clerk. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have it stay that way. But if we have like, uh, we'll say area six resident. If the resident position remains, if the area resident position remains uh, vacant for, we can say two or more or three or more regular board meetings, the board may fill that position with, with any qualified stakeholder okay so they, they would actually have a voting it's like electing someone onto the board they're just right like, okay i see i see what you're getting yeah that that is a lot easier that that way we can fill the position um uh, their 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 time that they would be able to uh, serve in that position would be until that position would be coming up for the next election by the city clerk. And then for the city clerk's elected election, they would have to uh, be a resident. Um, <clears throat> well, th I think that's, a, that's the only thing that that's probably, that's why I think I looked at the, to, to eradicate them from the election because in the definition of the election, when you put them in there, even like right now, we can't put anybody into like uh, area three because they would have to live, work, or own real property there. That That's kind of why I think that election thing to break up the sub areas has to be done because the, the definition of an area of a sub one is someone who lives, works, owns real property. Right. But um, if um, one must be a resident of the area, the other may be a resident or from any other eligible category of stakeholder. Okay. I think how we word it's going to be important, Ben. Um, like you said right now, I'm getting where, where you're going with it. It's almost like saying, um, like during the election, you must adhere to the rules. When we're when we're filling a seat, right, a vacancy, maybe that's the way we, we word it. When we're filling the vacancy, then those rules kind of go out the window. And you just have to live, work in the district of Lincoln Heights. And then you can. Oh, well, you have to be any other other qualified stakeholder. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's something that we're gonna have. To, I, I think they'll give us some pushback on that because they'll ask us to redo the the definition of those seats. They might, might not, but I think that's something that we need to look into. But I, I think where you're going, Ben, with it, I think it might work. I don't see why it wouldn't. Just because after an election, we have to fill the vacancy and. Like, like my concern right now, too, is we don't got too many people running in District 3, but we might have somebody that's a District 1 that can run in District 3 and we can elect them in. And now District 3 has a representative. Would that fly right. without, you know, without, um, you know, messing with it, it's that document at the end of the page. It's this one here the that they keep referring to. I don't want to get anybody sick because I'm scrolling down fast. It's this one here. This is the one where it defines, right? So, and technically when you look at what a stakeholder is, Benny, because I know you brought this up, really as, when you use the word stakeholder and then you have these special restrictions, right? Like, you know, you have to live work. It can't be somebody that is part of an organization or has an ongoing. Well, that's not true because the definition of it, we cannot redefine it. We cannot alter the city's definition of stakeholder. So technically all these spots are open up. You know, if you live, work, or an organization, that's why sometimes I even ask them, why do we even have like, like an organization or a business? Because at the end of the day, if you if you adhere to the definition of stakeholder in the city, then technically you can be part of a nonprofit 
and say, I'm running as a stakeholder because I have an invested interest in a nonprofit that's been here for a year under those guidelines and principles, right? So that's why I, I always fight them on that and they keep pushing back, but that's their definition, not ours. I'm just saying that they may come back here and say, okay, Vincent, you want to put someone that's in district two in the district one, but they don't live and they don't, they, well, basically see it says right here, they don't live. That's why it would have to be altered because this is a specific thing that the, even though it says stakeholder, it says who lives. So that that might limit them where we might have to dissolve the the um, the sub areas and then put it in our, our standing rule. But I think it's interesting to look into it because I think it would help us in the elections. But it, more importantly, working the sub areas, it allows us to give representation. But I think what we yeah. need to do first is contact the city on it and find out if we can do it the way Ben mentioned right now. Like if we put in uh, a section or amend one of the sections of vacancies and say, you know, when filling a vacancy, anybody, any anybody under the definition of stakeholder can fill in any empty seat after an election or after a vacancy. And that basically means that you have to live within the borderlines of Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council, right? To play it safe. I well, just, the that you'd be a, a stakeholder. A stakeholder, yeah. Because the, yeah. the only thing I worry my, about here. The, okay. the main one that I worry about is um, you had a period of time when you had the bike riders going in and all of a sudden uh, they wanted to uh, take over the neighborhood consoles. Uh -huh. And if the seats were at large, they could come in literally and run and if they had enough of a group backing them, they could get themselves elected. Okay, because they're gonna have a block vote for for all of them. And once they're in, uh, they're gonna do what they want and then they leave. Yeah. And um, the the way the bylaws are set up is so that you can't have a, uh, a group necessarily come in and take over the console mm -hmm. or, or let us say they, they can't just come in and, and take over the console uh, for a one issue and then disappear. They, they, they have to uh, abide by the definitions of each of the areas. And so they could take out all of the at-large seats, but they couldn't take out the resident seats. Then the election is over, you've got resident seats that are vacant. Um, we go uh, for two meetings and it remains vacant. Uh, then the board can fill those positions with uh, uh, as if they were at large. Yeah, no, I see the strategy behind it. I, I can I can definitely see that. To, that's why when you always, I mean, when we try to minimize it, sometimes that's where we eliminate ourselves. You know. Yeah, that was that was specifically uh, when Frank uh, was was writing the a lot of the. Um, um, bylaws. That was the one thing that he was worried about was um, let's say a, a group that was all in favor of marijuana uh, coming in and taking over the neighborhood council or uh, bike riders wanting to put bike lanes on everything or you know something like that. Uh, the councils where everything was that large uh, suddenly got wiped out and the two things that, that uh, keep us fairly safe is you have to be a resident of the area of, on, on filling a vacant, uh, on, on, on a regular election. And also uh, the alternating uh, 
at no at no election is the full council up for a vote. That's so that right. there is. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. So there's some kind of consistency among the council. It doesn't uh, suddenly uh, disappear. So, so I'm thinking. I'm thinking if we can get away with leaving the way the council and its voting subsections are, right? The sub areas. I, right. I think that's where they may have an issue. Maybe not. You know how they work, Ben. And then where we add it to our <clears throat> how to fill a vacancy, and a vacancy may be filled. Um, with, you know, I guess we're going to have to write one for every subsection, right? Sub area. Um, like for example, to fill in area, sub area one, we would have to alter what we see here before us right now, where it just says lives to be able to fulfill it. But, the, you know, during the election, you have to live in those districts. If you're going to run, right. you have to live in the district. And if we're going to fill a vacancy, then it gets loose, right? But then again, maybe the community has their own board in already, and then they can actually pick and filter them out better. Yeah, we can say, let's see. Two representatives from each area will be elected. One must be their resident of that area. The other may be a resident or from any other eligible category of stakeholders. Um, So maybe maybe we leave one original and one seat open up white not I don't want to say wide open but we leave it open to where it says live work own real property uh, community interest business that way it leaves us a broad uh, way to get somebody in at least to fill one representative seat and we hold the other representative seat like if it's going to vote that you must live there. Well, in, in general, okay, we don't have any problems because the at-large seat, uh, if it is, is vacant, we can fill it with any qualified stakeholder. Well, so, that, like right here, like if we tried to do that, like right now under sub one, like right now for sub three, we don't have anybody. We, we couldn't just fill it with the stakeholder because even under our rules right here, let me see, seven uh, who is 18 years or older, and then it's restricted to people who live, people who live. Now, technically for me, the word stakeholder, if you look at it and we cannot alter it, we can't define it. We have to use the city's definition it already opens the door. So let's say I'm going to come in, like right now, the way the bylaw is written here, who like lives. If I wanted to challenge sub area three and say, okay, I'm in seven, but I'm going to run in three. And I'm running under stakeholdership as defined as the city, not as defined as the neighborhood council that says I have to live there. But I, I want to say I, I join, you know, the Lincoln Heights Tigers. And I'm in that district and I'm going to use that organization with the paper and I'm going to run for sub three. Technically, well, you could, you could for the at large. Yeah. You could for the at large, but you can't for the resident. Okay. The resident, the resident, the resident is the one that causes us a problem uh, because we can fill any at-large position with any any eligible stakeholder, and we've done that consistently. Okay. But um, what ultimately remains open a lot of the time is the um, uh, like Area Seven residents. Okay, uh, the area six residents, because it can only be a resident according to that. And what I would suggest is we put in there, um, and we have to look at which section we put it under, uh, but 
if a resident position remains unfilled during a an election or remains vacant for two consecutive meetings of the neighborhood council the board of directors may fill the position with any eligible stakeholder okay i get you and so that way we take care of our uh, un un unfilled resident position our, our unfilled at large position we can always fill them if someone wants to apply okay i get what you're saying now right now it's more like we need someone to apply we can we can fill several of the at large positions okay no no that makes sense that's good but um we we filled a number of the at large positions um it'd be nice if they lived in the area but hey there's no one there running that lives in the area um but we have someone else who's a stakeholder and is very interested in what we're doing um we fill the at-large position. This would allow us to say, gee, we've got a resident position. No one ran for it in the clerk's election and it's remained vacant for, or it has remained vacant for two or more consecutive meetings, which could mean, gee, uh, someone ran for the, at the clerk's election, but then they resigned um okay it remains vacant for two or more uh meetings uh the board uh may choose to um appoint any eligible stakeholder to that position <laughs> no i agree I, I think that's a good idea ben what you said at the last time that we we add in those that wording in there in those little boxes and um and see if we because i know i know what's going to end up happening like what we do or benny i don't benny i don't know if you've ever been part of the process of bylaws i know ben has we're going to submit them they're going to go to the city attorney for verbiage and approval and you know mending they're going to understand what we're trying to do with them then we'll get them back and that's when the board approves them um but I think I think right now I think we 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 got that I think we got that section pretty good without having to do anything major to it. But like Ben was saying, just to actually add on to the uh, resident seat, you know, in the event that it's vacant for more than two months, right? That the uh, the general board or the, the board of directors will have the authority to to fill the seat with this with anybody any. Um, eligible stakeholder any but any eligible stakeholder correct so i think that's good because that'll help us you know and like and like we already have one here like ben po pointed out the at-large seats right now just so that we know people can can um and they can they can try to uh get elected onto the board all they have to do is follow the the stakeholdership so if they live work own real property or have a community interest then they can actually put an application in right now for the at large, right? And and we're we're making the resident seat the same, except we have to add different verbiage to it. Right. Okay. No, I think that's good. That was a good. That's. Yeah, I I have to say this is the easiest bylaw committee we had because usually people are throwing kicks and punches. Pow! Wham! So we got some good people thinking here. No, no, and, and that, that was oh, the Sarah's only one I was going to bring up. And I think that I think that we should all go back and look at it again. But we do need to set a time. And I know Ben said he was going to contact to find out more about the form, right? And uh, and to see what we can do on there, because I, I, you know, we'll put these documents together and then get it approved but we, we should be picking a day we have to meet again before the executive committee 
because these have to be on the uh, general board for approval. And then we got to send them in. Uh, do you know the deadline, Ben? It's in April. Yeah, it's in April. Okay, we'll find out the deadline too for them, but we should we should try to get it in uh, before the the uh, executive, so we can have it at our next general board meeting. Right. Um, let's see. You think we should give it like a week, two weeks, Ben? Um. What is, um, oh, where's my calendar here? Um, we're at the fourth. Um, what about either the eighth or ninth of March? I'm open on the, hold on, I had something on the mind. What about you, Benny? Okay, I'm digging up my phone here. And... I, I'm okay on the 8th. March 8th or 9th? Oh, that's Tuesday or Wednesday already. Oh, no, coming up. Next week, yeah. Um, yeah. No, we don't, Sarah, we don't have a pluck meeting right until the week oh, after that. We have the pluck on the 16th of next month, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so either one worked for me, the 8th or the 9th. Is fine. I'm flexible. What do you think, Ben? We should do it on the ninth to give us an extra day so we can get all this going. Yeah, May 9th. Okay, March. May. 9th. March ninth. Okay, so um, we'll find out at uh, on March ninth. Five thirty. Five thirty again. Okay. So we all got our homework to do, and then we'll we'll tap into all this this stuff and get a document ready with everyone's um, you know opinions and amendments, and then we'll get it ready for the board. Okay. Okay, so I'll help put the the meeting. I'll, I'll get the meeting on our Zoom, and then I'll copy our agenda and get our agenda ready for uh, March 9th. Yeah, and the agenda should almost be a duplicate of, of this one. Correct. Yeah, and if there's anything that we need to add on, just let me know ahead of time so we can uh, post it up. Now, oh, go ahead. Um, The real danger is we we need uh, 18 members at the meeting uh, in, to have our vote effective for the the uh, bylaws. Yeah. How many do we have right now? 18. No, I mean on the board. 18. Oh wow! So everybody has to show up. Right. Oh my gosh! All right. Yeah. See, that, that, that's why it's something to think about. When we, that's why it's it's good to lower the numbers. You and, and I understand what what Ben was trying to do because that's how you protect it. But that's when members are all twenty five members are present, you know. And Ben will tell you, I've been on on these boards for a long time. You you just never know when you're gonna have a good board going for two or three years, and all of a sudden it just falters, right? And then you're you're at this point where everybody has to show up. If you don't then what we're trying to fix to perfect the bylaws, right? Get stuck because we can't vote for them. So in our next meeting, just take all of that into consideration because right now we're facing why these numbers need to be smaller and why we're even contacting the city to make them smaller. Not because 
we want to, it just makes our board vulnerable. Um, where we're yeah. going to have to have two thirds of the vote now. That's why a lot of times we just simple majority. Even though bylaws are very important and they govern us, right? They're the rules, your Bible basically of the council and, and also the public. It's it's the only thing that the board members and the public have to understand how we, we function, right? And where their yeah. part is in it. So it's something to think about because yeah, we don't want to run into this. If we get all 18 there and we get this passed, we really need to consider lowering those numbers so we don't have to do it again. Because that we may have to do alterations as we go along. It's just, it's always risking, you know? If the 25 would show up, that's it. If we had 25 members, we'd, we'd be okay. So yeah, let's take it into consideration and, and rediscuss it on May 9th and see what we feel at that point if we want to you know lower them or not but let's let's hear right. back what the city has to say okay all right Any, anything else motion to adjourn i second the motion all in favor aye aye, aye. all opposed nobody opposes no abstentions nope everyone it's unanimous thank you ben Thank you. Okay. Ben, I, I can see ben, Benny was already going to sleep. <laughs> no, just uh, uh, the re uh, I'm going to need a restroom. He's a restroom pretty soon. <laughs> I was going to call. I was going to move for a five minute break or a two and a half minute break. So. Oh, now you have the whole evening. <laughs> All right, everyone. Okay. Take care. Have a safe night, Benny. Sarah, I you. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.